Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this special Actual Tech Media webinar event presented in partnership with Veeam as part of the Trailblazer Talk series, Bad Things Happen to Good Data. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, what sorts of bad things can happen to good data, how frequently that happens, and I think uh, you won't be surprised to find that it's often. And, uh, and we're going to talk about some strategies for how to protect your business and how to better understand the marriage between the uh, technical pieces that we can use for protection and the business requirements to understand the full business continuity data protection picture. So it's going to be an enlightening event. I think you'll find it's a lot of fun. I'm excited for it. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started. Um, I'm James Green. I'm going to be your moderator for the event, and I will introduce the speakers in just a moment here. But I want to let you know that uh, there's a questions panel here in your attendee console that I encourage you to make liberal use of. We're going to have a section at the end for Q&A where we're going to take those questions and uh, Melissa and Jason are going to tackle some of them. Please submit your question right when you have it in the Q&A panel there. We're, we're watching those as they come in. We'll organize them and sort of prioritize. I'm sure we won't have time to get to everything, so we'll kind of watch for recurring themes and things that come up um, again and again, and we'll kind of prioritize those questions and pick out some that'll be helpful for everybody. So please ask those as you have them. As well, in the same part of your console, there are a number of handouts that we'd love for you to grab and take with you, uh, a bit of further reading on this topic and uh, ways that you can dive deeper and some resources for you. And finally, I'm going to be giving away two Amazon gift cards on this event today. First, uh, at the very end of the event, we're going to give away a $300 Amazon gift card to one lucky winner. In the handouts panel there, you'll see a link to the Actual Tech Media prize policy that applies to this giveaway. So if you need any details about whether you're eligible or how it's uh, accounted for or any of that, it's all in the prize policy there in the handouts. Go ahead and grab that. We'll be giving away that $300 gift card at the very end. Also, as I mentioned, we want to have a conversation at the end of this event, and we need your questions. And to incentivize you to share all of your best questions, we're giving away a $50 gift card after the event to the very best question. So we're going to collect them all, read literally every single one, and pick out the best question and deliver a $50 gift card. So we'll contact you after the event if you're the winner of one of those gift cards. So I'm excited to get to it. I know you are too. So without further ado, let me introduce you to your presenters today and we'll get started. Uh, in a moment, you're going to be hearing from Jason Buffington, VP of Solutions Strategy at Veeam and Melissa Palmer, Team Lead and Senior Technologist of Product Strategy at Veeam. They've got a enlightening and engaging conversation lined up for you that I'm excited to get started on. So let's do it. I do love the opening video. That splash is That was pretty cool. good. That was pretty good. I like that. All right. So Melissa, today we're going to talk about when bad things happen to good data. And, and here's the yeah. subtext for this. The, the promise for the folks at home, 45 years of BCDR in 45 minutes in nine Mostly easy steps. Years. So, Mostly his years. Mostly my Sorry. years. Okay, so I've got a little bit more gray than you do. But we are going to spend a lot of time talking about backup and recovery and business continuity. Um, but we thought we'd start off with a little bit of data, right? So, so why are we talking about bad things? What kinds of bad things can happen to good data? Um, every year, Veeam does an analyst report. Uh, this is uh, by far what we believe to be the largest independent research project on data protection ever conducted. There was 3,000 IT respondents, all unbiased, from 28 countries around the world, most of them being enterprises, meaning organizations with more than 1,000 employees. And one of the questions that was asked year over year is, what were the kinds of outages that caused impact? What was the most impactful in 2019? What was the most impactful in 2020? And I do think it's interesting. Melissa, we see a lot of hardware. Um, on the top of that list when you're looking Isn't at most common outages. Isn't that funny? Outages. A lot of hardware failures. Hmm, who would have thought? 
now, but here's the fun part. Take a look at the spikes, the little spikes as far as what was most impactful. Um, we see OS software outages, and I would call some of that to be configuration issue. Um, I do think it's really interesting that last year there was a tie most impactful cause of outage was either infrastructure, meaning you couldn't get to your stuff, or cyber. Any comments on that one, Melissa? You might not have been able to get to your stuff because of the cyber, too. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But Fair yeah, enough. it's kind of two things. We knew a lot of people were working from home a lot last year. A lot of companies just weren't prepared to handle that volume of incoming connections. And they might have done silly things to get things working. And maybe that opened them up to some cybersecurity event potential as well. Yeah, we just published actually a full report on cloud trends. And one of the biggest challenges that a lot of folks saw, especially as they were hyper adopting, right, especially during duress, um, cloud-based infrastructure was in many cases, they had challenges with actually connecting to those cloud-based resources. And I'll tell you, last year, when I first started playing with cloud-hosted infrastructure, I couldn't get to my resources either until I figured it out. And then I realized afterward, what I'd actually figured out was I completely turned off the firewall and everybody could get to my stuff as easily as I could. Um, that sounds about it, right, yeah. That's all my connectivity issue. All right, so let's get into the pain points though. So one of the things I think is really interesting about outages is the high expectations that organizations have for access to their data. And I wanna get through the data part a little, pretty quick so we can talk about the what to do about it. But one of the things that was interesting was again in the same report, and I do encourage you to go uh, in that upper link in the upper right hand corner, the data protection report for 2021. I believe it's also one of the handouts available um, on today's event. But some of the questions that were asked around how much downtime Time can you tolerate? Now, the question was asked around high priority data as well as normal data. And I think there's two things that folks should take away. One, there's just not that much difference in the expectations. No, there's really not. People, <laughs> no. You know, it used to be, um, uh, you poked fun earlier, most of the years in BCDR mine, back when I started, there was that 5% of applications that were mission critical and everything else had nightly tape backup, right? That's right. not what we're seeing today, right? I mean, everything has that dial tone set of expectations. Amen? Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like, what, about 15 minutes to four hours is a pretty big sweet spot. Yeah. In fact, actually, we can tighten that down a little bit. Take a look at the one hour part. I mean, this is crazy. Okay, that's scary. 41% of high priority applications, and you expect this, right? So high priority application, it should be a uh, uh, near zero downtime tolerance, an hour or less, about not quite half, but a third, a third of the rest of the applications have that same hour or less downtime. That's crazy. That is crazy. Now here's the fun part. This is the expectation. Now let's look at how often do you protect? Cause this drives me nuts, right? Cause when people say, well, I can't mm. afford to lose more than a couple hours downtime and I back up every night. Right? And this is probably the biggest mismatch, right? People are saying, oh, my application is super critical. I need it to be available. Can't be down for more than an hour, but I'm taking a backup once a day. Right, right. And this Doesn't is where match. we start to see that same problem. And again, I would just point out for the folks at home, high priority and normal don't look that different, right? That expectation is there is no such thing as a low priority IT resource, right? I think that's really kind of the takeaway from this. When you talk about downtime though, so we talk about it as, oh my gosh, I can't get to stuff, but there's a lot of other things that happen when you can't get to stuff. So let's talk about the last part of the pain. And I thought this was really, really interesting because you can see here that obviously loss of customer confidence, loss of brand becomes a top line. I would, I would actually offer, there's kind of three bands of, of bad things that happen uh, when you can't get to your good data. Those first uh, two, that's external implications, right? So loss of customer mm -hmm, confidence, absolutely. loss of brand integrity. And then the next two, those are internal ramifications, right? So mm -hmm. I'm an employee, I can't get to my stuff, I can't do my job. And oh, by the way, why am I gonna give IT any more money next year when they can't even maintain the stuff they're doing this year? Right, so diversion of resources. And then we have when everybody else gets involved, right? We get stock price, yeah. we get legal action, we get accreditation, right? Um, the other way to look at this, by the way, um, the very bottom option on this chart, 8% said, yeah, no problem with downtime, right? 8%. Um, those 8%, um, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Corinne Bissett, she called this a resume generating event. 
which I just thought was absolutely brilliant. I just anyway. that is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but those are those are the impacts of downtime. It's more than just the inconvenience of getting to data. What have you felt over the years when you've been talking to customers about things like this? Yeah, it really comes down to the, the top two are really big. It depends on what line of business they're in. But if they're a company that is um, basically impacting things like manufacturing or even a website or they're a really big, well-known brand, that brand damage, you know, if I want to go to buy something and I can't get it from one site, I'll just go to another site. And do I ever go back to that first site again? Because it was down when I wanted to use it. I probably don't, right? So those are definitely uh, pretty big ones. And then, you know, a lot, of uh, a lot of people don't necessarily tie this back to the financial things, right? Because they're just like, well, you know, somebody doesn't use our web app anymore. Whoop-de-doo. Well, how much does that actually cost you, right? That's sometimes a translation layer that doesn't quite make it. That is very important because maybe they would feel differently if they realized, well, each customer conversion is approximately $100. And if I multiply that out by 100,000 people that can't get to my app, it's a lot of money. Sure. Um, I was doing with a, a healthcare company last week and they, they were very quick. We were talking about BCDR strategy. And one of the very first things they said was, Jason, there, there is no amount of money that we could quantify our losses with because the systems that we were talking about were patient care, right? Um, uh, I was working with a branch of the military not that long ago, same kind of idea. This was mission critical. Um, and they use that M word very differently than those of us yes. in the public sector. So, all right, so that's, that's our perspective. That's some unbiased research that does that. You know who else is really good at unbiased research? Gartner. So Gartner last year actually did a report on, and by the way, speaking of Gartner, Check out the MQ that came out today. That was kind of awesome. Oh, really? Um, for, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Up and to the right, baby. It's the only way Veeam goes. Anyway, uh, so, but last year, Veeam published a report on 16 tips to enhance disaster recovery. And I really like this report. You and I have both spent a lot of time in BCDR. Yes. Um, I was a DR planner for several years. And a lot of these tenants come right out of that. And they fortified uh, what that looks like for a modern IT infrastructure. The highlighting here is actually ours. We added that just to kind of make the slide a bit more interesting and a little bit more green. Uh, but there's kind of three aspects of what Gartner came up with that I thought would be interesting for our talk today, Melissa. One is aligning IT with business requirements. The secondly is around improving documentation. And then mm -hmm. the third around continuous improvement. And my guess is you've got a couple of opinions on a couple of these things as we go throughout the day. I do. I do have a couple of opinions on many of these things, actually. All of them. All right. I well, think. then let's get into it. So. Um, what we promised you is nine easy steps. And so we've got a little bit of a grid going on, but there's really kind of, we're going to use Gartner's categories because it's a nice way to lump the things together. But um, the three categories that they and also the DRII came up with um, was around aligning IT to the business and not vice versa, right? This is a business driven strategy, not an IT driven one. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, the power of documentation. And then lastly, continuous improvements. So shall we begin? Absolutely. All right. So the first one is around, again, aligning disaster recovery with the business, aligning it with business continuity. A lot of people just t seem to use these terms interchangeably, right? It used to be we would talk about backup, and then it wasn't about backup. Yeah, they do. Before. But then it's about disaster recovery. No, no, no. It's about business continuity. This is not buzzword bingo, right? There's a real difference between these terms. Yeah, absolutely. And you really can't come up with a DR strategy. When we talk disaster recovery, that's a very finite technical thing. That is, how am I meeting my RTOs and RPOs and how do I actually recover? What system software, what is all the stuff I have in place? BC ties back to the business requirements, right? What are my RTOs and RPOs and how did I come up with them, right? Who, what stakeholders did I talk to? How did I determine I can't lose more than four hours of data, right? H how did this all happen to feed into the disaster recovery practices? That's right. So let's talk about that. So you mentioned the word stakeholder, which I think is a brilliant first word. So let's talk through that. So when you talk about just even forgetting BCDR first, let's just talk about pragmatic data protection, backing up your stuff, right? For a lot of everybody folks, <laughs> everybody, and, and it's amazing how many folks are not doing it well today. And this is not a Veeam thing. This is just like, look at the data. People are, are number one reason why people, by the way, are changing their backup solutions, reliability. They cannot get their stuff to work. But Coming back to the stakeholders, um, when you talk about who should be involved in actually just defining data protection strategy, arguably there's at least three technical groups that should be involved. The back of admin, right? Because they understand things like establishing policy, long-term retention requirements, regulatory mandates. 
We've got IT ops, right? They're the people responsible for actually standing up these servers and making sure they're always great. Um, and then the app loader, uh, the workload owner, right? The people that are actually standing up SQL and Oracle and Exchange. You spend a lot of your time um, actually making this stuff real for folks. Where do you see the gap? Who gets left out the most? Uh, I'm going to say probably the application people for some strange reason, right? Um, if I'm the backup admin, I'm like, all right, I've got a job. It goes every eight hours, blah, blah, blah. But why, why does this job go every eight hours? There's got to be a reason for that. And that's tying it back to the applications, right? And it, it is. It's SQL, Oracle. It's all those enterprise apps and kind of all the layers they feed into. Mm -hmm. And really the apps are what is driving the business, right? As much as I love infrastructure and I've made a career out of infrastructure, you need that solid foundation. But at the end of the day, it's about the apps, right? So what is their requirements? What is their function? And what is their tolerance for downtime and data loss, right? So that's, I feel like a lot of times people kind of miss that step. So it comes back to your example. Okay, I can only have an hour of downtime or lose an hour of data, but I'm backing up once a day. That means people aren't talking to each other. Right. That's your punchline right there, right? So if we were doing banner ads in the bottom of the screen, that's our first takeaway is people aren't talking to each other, right? So the problem is, is that a Word document and a SQL database look exactly the same until the app gets involved. Right, it's just zeros and yeah, ones. That's true. Um, and so, so does the app owner have an expectation of what it takes to stand that up? IT is responsible for standing it up, and backup is what happens in order to make sure that when bad things happen to good data, as the as the title does announce, that we have some way to remediate back on that. But these are just the technical owners, and so we talk about people that are not involved enough in the conversation. They're not talking to each other. Um, I love this chart. This one actually came from a third party blog, uh, centralizedbackup.com, and you can see all those IT stakeholders we see on the right hand side. We listed most of them, right? The backup admins, data protection, IT ops, the application admins. But let's talk for a second about all the people that rely on the data. Right. This is the yeah, difference between that's a lot of people. And BC. It's a lot of people. Uh, and by the way, those folks, just like the folks on the right hand side, are not interchangeable. Right. The the archivists legal have a different lens and a different set of requirements than compliance and, and business unit owners. So we've got people talking to each other. And I guess this is the third part. Um, and I don't think we have a link for this in the uh, in the handouts, but maybe we can provide one after the fact. We did actually publish a book on data protection by the numbers for dummies. And actually, we, this graphic comes straight out of that book talking about there's kind of three languages that people ought to be speaking when they're planning and defining data protection strategy. There's the technical language. Uh, that folks like Melissa and I love, right? RPO, RTO, those kinds of folks. Um, there's the business language, right? The business impact analysis, risk analysis, understanding the dependencies on the data. And then there's the financial, right? So does it cost more to have a loss or does it cost more to protect? And I'm going to vote and for the latter. Is very, that is very important right there, what you just said, Jason, because a lot of times if there hasn't been a proper disaster recovery strategy put into place and it hasn't been tested and it hasn't been documented, it comes back to the financials, right? Because oh, yeah. someone decided someplace that the risk was so low of something happening and it didn't make sense to spend all this money to fix this. Literally, it's almost the same kind of exercise as uh, deciding, should I have health insurance or should I have <laughs> life insurance? Or should I have auto insurance, right? You you weigh the risk and the and the implications of not being able to cover that versus the minor amount of cost that you would do to actually cover yourself. It really, I mean, that's why backup has always had uh, insurance as an analogy along the way. All right, so let's get into so so I guess our first takeaway is align with the business, right? So this is about more people should be talking to each other. Let's take a look yep, at number absolutely. two. BCDR is more than just backup, right? But let's make sure we're clear. If you ain't got backups, you do not have BCDR, right? If you do not have survivable data, there is no set of policies and workflows that will get your business running again. That is a true statement. But, yeah, So let, but let's talk about that because if BCDR is more than just backup, what I hope you hear today, we talked about this at the beginning, 45 years of BCDR, of backup and IT data custodianship experience, the skills are different. Right. So if you're a backup admin, right, if you're a backup admin, so, you know, backups, you know, snapshots, you know, replicas, you know, the stuff that you must know, you must know how to use Veeam or some little product that wants to be Veeam. 
right? You must know the applications. You must know the hypervisors. You know, these are all good things. Um, and then there's the should knows as well. The things that wrap around that. That is different than the skill set for what you need for a BCDR planner. You, you might come from that backup side of the world, but this is actually much more in line with what does it take to really do BCDR? Let's talk about those must knows, Melissa. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, economics, right? That kind of stands out right there for me, right? You need to have the data that's going to substantiate how you come up with those RPOs and RTOs, right? For each and every application, tying it back to the more technical thing, business to IT dependencies. And here's something that I've seen a lot of people missing. They go in a vacuum and they classify every application. Okay. Every application has its own RPO, RTO. We're putting together DR plans. We're good. What order do they need to come up in? Which ones are the most important that need to be running first, right? So I might have an RTO of four hours, but within that four hour window, which are most critical to the, the business and what do I start with? That's what I see a lot of missing that dependency. What, what are the applications that we actually need to be operational? And then kind of tying yeah. it back to, yeah. So I, uh, and then of course, you know, on geo and industry sovereignty, right? So in some verticals, in some industries, there actually are mandates on how fast does stuff have to come back up? You know, one of the lessons learned after 9-11 was that, you know, even after um, the, the, um, the initial crisis was over, money wasn't moving across right. the across the financial system right and so the the sec and and uh, actually came up with a set of, in, of standards that said you know certain servers certain key capabilities the plumbing has to come up first because if the plumbing isn't there money didn't move right and so certainly there are some industries there are some sovereignties that have requirements around that but certainly being aware of okay so what what applications do different business units rely on? And then having an actual economic understanding of how much does it really cost um, when that stuff goes offline. But I think the thing that, that is important to note is, is that the backup admin alone, and we love backup admins here at Veeam. We do. Yeah, we love great. backup admins. But backup admins alone are not going to drive the conversations on the right-hand side of that screen. And in fact, uh, this is actually from an ESG study done in the Enterprise Strategy Group a few years back. And they actually surveyed, you know, what groups were at the table, what personas in BCDR strategy. And then, oh, by the way, who is driving, right? And, and take a look at the backup admins. And again, word Veeam, we love backup admins. But the backup admin was actually only at the table 29% of the time. They were only driving the BCDR conversation about 7% percent of the time. This is a much bigger conversation that backup is absolutely critical in, but just don't presume that your backup admin is going to be your BCDR leader that's going to take you down this path and ensure that that IT resiliency actually happens. Get more people sitting around that table. Uh, Melissa, absolutely. we're going to need a bigger conference table. Sounds good. All right, little Jaws reference for the kids at home. All right, third one, and and uh, you actually started to allude to this already, is understanding the relationship between the different platforms out there. But the the key to offer at this point is planning for crises of all sizes, and having different tiers of applications. I've watched you unpack this for customers before. This is Gartner's version, but it rings pretty yeah, similar absolutely. to some of the stuff that you've walked them through before. Help us understand what this is really telling us. Yeah, this is really just kind of talking about our types of applications and how to tier them, how many tiers of service you have in your environment, because here's the important part. You're going to protect your data and plan to recover it differently based on what that RTO and RPO is, right? For example, tier zero critical data, uh, zero to 15 minute RTO, zero RPO, that is continuous data protection. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You need to be continuously protecting that data and be able to fail over, right? Um, once we get lower down, there's different things you can do, and you can actually get really, um, really creative with how you're doing things when you have bigger windows, right? So some of that tier two business critical, uh, RT and RPO 24 hours, like I can protect and restore that 75 different ways and make it really economical, right? But it's the most money is usually spent on those critical applications because of those really aggressive RTOs and RPOs that you need to meet really what it comes down to. And then one other thing, the deferrable bronze, important silver, like the bronze. I've actually been talking about this tier a lot because if you can get your DR solution to a point where everything is automated and orchestrated, you can have a DR plan in place for that. The stuff that you never had the DR plan before because oh, it's deferrable, we can live without it. It would be nice to have, but we just don't have the time or the effort, the people. Everything goes into play when you can automate things.
Mm-hmm. The thing that, that always amazes me is when you have those conversations with the business leader owners and they talk about, well, we have to have email or we have to have this, this uh, client processing software, we have to have this custom application. So many of them miss things like, it'd be really good if Active Directory was still there. Um, yeah, it's kind really of important, right? If DNS email? was still DNS? there, right? I mean, and and the and the sales guys, right? The the sales leaders and the VPs and the execs and stuff, they're going like, well, no one really needs that thing. I mean, I don't remember ever connecting to that application. Mm. It's how you log on, right? I mean, so you know, so, but but understanding again, this goes back to that SEC example after nine eleven, the plumbing. The plumbing matters, right? So you can't start up all those other applications until you get that going in. You can't do that until networking is there. So having a plan for resiliency of the infrastructure so that you can uh, stand that up. What I think is going to be really interesting for folks as they look over the next couple of years is as organizations look towards hybrid IT and leveraging cloud hosting as their secondary infrastructure of choice, all of a sudden things like plumbing starts to look a lot different. And yet the yeah. app doesn't know that. And so that'll be an interesting area of growth and, uh, and evolution over the next couple of years. All right, let's, uh, uh, let's, so that's, that's our first column. So aligning IT with the business. And hopefully we've given you a few things to go back and, and check with the kids at home. Let's talk about something which is near and dear to everybody's heart. Everybody loves this part, right? I love it. I can't help it. I do. I know, bless your heart. All right, but yes, documentation. It's actually the most key thing. So um, uh, one of the toughest lessons I learned when I first started in business continuity is, is presume that the people that wrote the plan will not be there to enact the plan. Right now, it's easy to yeah. talk about the dire scenarios, right? Well, not easy, but you get my point. But the, the example that I learned with way back when, so I lived down in Texas and Houston is notorious for floods every couple of years. And one of my instructors in my first BCDR course explained that, because um, they, they come from Houston, look, they get that the businesses in downtown Houston were underwater. So was their living room. And so they didn't go to work that day to help the organization stand up their IT data because they were bailing water out of their living room while their two kids were sitting on floating couches, right? I mean, that's a true story, right? So don't plan on the original authors being part um, of that solution. Uh, uh, so what can you do to script it? What can you do to document that along the way? You've mitigated- And another really good thing- itself. Oh, I have. And another really good thing in this case is, you know, how can we keep our documentation consistent, right? Because that person might have to run three or four different plans, this poor random vSphere admin who wanders in the day of disaster. You might have her recover four different apps. That documentation really needs to be consistent and uniform. And you need to be doing everything the same way to make it easier for these poor people who have never done anything before. I mean, better yet, have it happen automatically, right? We're working towards that. But at the end of the day, that plan is still gonna exist. Even if it happens automatically, you're gonna get a report at the end that's gonna say, okay, everything looks good. Someone's still gonna have to read that report and sign off on it and make sure, okay, we are in fact good. Yeah, consistency is absolutely huge. As far as yeah. goes, especially because you're right, you're gonna bring in a lot of ad hoc players that are technically competent, but they weren't part of your plan. Right. And right. so how do you enable them to be successful so that your organization can be successful um, in its recovery? Um, so uh, and you started to talk about this already. Right. So there's one thing to yeah. document every detail. The next thing is, can we please script it, please? And chances are you can. Right. I, I've done the DR test with the clipboards and the manual run books and flipping through pages and pages and pages. Chances are. Once you get a handle on that documentation, you can actually go back to that and do some kind of basic scripting around that. I know we had a lot of scripts. We would like literally manually run. Someone would have to go click the script to run it. Like that's, that's kind of silly. Let's automate everything. And more importantly, let's tie that back to the documentation, right? Let's have those scripts feed right back into our documentation that we're gonna get at the end saying, okay, everything was successful. Um, here's the output from the script saying that everything is verified, everything's running as expected and we're good to go. Let's, let's tie it all together. Yeah, I'd argue there's almost like a good, better, best that comes out of this. So, so right. good, you at least theoretically know the steps, you know, better, <laughs> let's actually put the scripts into something that'll actually run consistently each time. And then best, use that to, to test consistently. And then better than best, can I say that? Better than best, feed your, sure. feed your documentation engine. So, um, so uh, 
you might have something to talk about on this one. I, yeah, I might a, have an answer? I might have a little something for that, right? So we could use Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator and do fun things like, hey, we have things that we need to run before the plan starts. We ha might have to kick off some DNS changes for that application or something like that. We run our uh, disaster recovery plan, which is made out of different plan steps against our VMs and our plan and whatever we need to. And we have all the stuff we need, right? You know, restore from recovery, migrate it to the new data store, rename enterprise application steps built into the system too. Checks for Exchange, SQL, DNS, AD, um, pretty much anything you would need to cover. So it's really this easy to use. You can see right here, HTML5 drag and drop interface to kind of build your disaster recovery plan. And spoiler alert, it's going to kick out a document at the end that has every step on every VM, everything that happens, and most importantly, has an audit log at the end too to please your auditors, right? So if Jason logs in the night after I fix everything and starts removing steps and changing plans around, I'm going to see that and I'm not going to have any potential audit risks either. I, I I choose to ignore everything that you just said on that part about <laughs> about documentation because that's our next step along the way, right? But but yeah. So yeah. but by, by the way, I I will say um, uh, for for the kids at home that have been that have been following the Trailblazer series from Veeam, I'm just going to go on a limb and tell you, uh, the orchestration technology from Veeam is easily the best kept secret at Veeam. It is. Um, it uh, is. One of the things that I preach as often as I can help folks pay attention to, and I've been doing this for. 31 years, right? Easily the key to success of surviving any kind of crisis, earthquake, fire, flood, human, cyber, pick your favorite crisis, right? Easily one of the biggest determinants for whether or not your organization will survive that is what you can do to shrink the time of remediation. Orchestration mm -hmm. shrinks the time of remediation. Um, that's a lot of syllables, but write that down. Orchestration uh, uh, reduces the time um, for mitigation. Um, and as, as Melissa mentioned, not only do you want to do every step and do them consistently in your plan, in your tests, in your documentation, so that when you do it for real, it happens, but could we please centralize everything? Could we please document everything and actually come through and documentation? Absolutely. Absolutely. We can pop that right all into Orchestrator. Um, there's a bunch of different reports that'll kick out for you. Probably one of my favorites is this readiness check. It's a lightweight check that runs scheduled daily. It lets you know, hey, are you meeting your RPO first and foremost, right? Because you'll configure your plan and set in the plan. What are my RPO and RTO? Hey, you're good to go. But it also checks your recovery resources. And a lot of people just like leave that DR site collecting dust and don't do anything to it. And they go to recover yep. and it's not working. Well, Orchestrator is going to look at that too. So for example, um, I had one run in my lab the other day and it flagged with a warning. And I'm like, warning, what happened? Apparently I had a host fail. It was in maintenance mode and Orchestrator let me know, hey, you've got a host in maintenance mode over there. You might want to check it out to make sure you have enough capacity to recover to. So besides that, you'll also get detailed. We're about to talk about testing, testing reports, that plan definition, which is your DR plan. And if you actually need to Go click the big blue button and run a disaster recovery plan. You'll get fully documented plan results as well. So I've been at Veeam for about three and a half years. One of my last gigs before this, I was a full-time DR planner for a while. But I remember I'd been at Veeam for about, I don't know, three, four months-ish. And, and you showed me this tool for the very first time, Melissa. And truly, it was one of the most mind-blowing moments of things I did not know. And I thought I had a pretty good beat on BCDR. But I remember you showing me the readiness check report and where something had broken was there was a VM that unknown to me in, in, in our test lab had a static IP address. So you could fail it over between VMware hosts and it just kept looking like it was really, really agile. But the readiness check actually exposed it because it had a static IP address and not a DHCP address. When that VM would have tried to start at the secondary facility, it would have failed. The application would have broke. And there's nothing Unless, I could have done to solve that um, without plumbing and remediation. That readiness check and, blew my mind. Yeah. And then once you actually have that data, there's actually a ton of different network remapping and re-IPing you can do natively through Orchestrator. You can have Orchestrator change the IP address for you, but you have to know it has to be changed somehow. Right. Right. Uh, uh, if, if, you, if you do nothing else out of this webinar, please do this. Increment your testing schedule. 
Uh, I mean, yeah. because, because that well, that's going to expose so many things for you along the way, um, which, by the way, kind of brings us right into, you know, tip number seven. This is one that I have been preaching for, uh, well, easily 20 plus years, because uh, so when I first started doing a practitioner for this, um, the the mod, uh, so here's the data for it. And then let me kind of unpack it for you. So the percent of DR tests that succeed, this is actually, again, based on some ESG research back um, a couple years ago, approximately what percentage of organization tests that succeed. And I don't think it's in the chart on this version of the graphic, but I think the answer was like 64%, um, which I was actually really happy with, right? And here's why. I find that, in, in, at least in my experience, there's two kinds of people that test DR. There are people that are trying to make their boss happy. And how do you make your boss happy? You show everything. Bingo. Works. Three check marks. Bingo. Right? Now, here's the problem. And, and, and take a screenshot of this, put it on your cube wall, right? If you are looking for green check marks, if you're looking for success, then you'll find it when you want to because you aren't going to look that hard. And then when you actually need to fail over, you can be surprised that all things don't work. As opposed to if culturally you make it acceptable to look for the red X's, you're not looking for failure. You're looking for opportunity to improve. Then yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You'll figure it out. There's some really dubious things you can do with your DR test to make it pass for compliance purposes that aren't indicative of how you would actually do in a real world failure scenario. You cannot fake an orchestrator test. You cannot cheat an orchestrator test. It literally spins up a complete non-disruptive copy of your environment from your backup replicas, whatever, in your recovery site and runs through the whole DR test. There's no fixing this. This is the real world recovery. This is exactly what's going to happen when you hit that button during a disaster. Yeah. If, if the only person that you're trying to make happy is the auditor, then when a crisis actually occurs, the auditor is going to be the only person who's They don't happy. care. No. <laughs> No, care. you pass an audit. Yay for you, right? Uh, this again goes back to what Ren uh, called a resume generating event, right? So instead, you should be looking for um, opportunities to improve. You should be maniacally looking for what details. If I have a 97% success rate, I'm going to celebrate the 97. That's great. And then I put all my resources into, okay, what do we need to do to, to, to mitigate that 3%? How do we continuously improve? So certainly one of the things that we hope happens is that continuous improvement mm. that comes right back to our yeah. readiness check, right? Yeah, the, the, the readiness check, like I said, that's a really lightweight check. The actual data lab test is really more in depth, but right here, boom, RPO failed. So if you actually take a look at something, you can see that something's not backing up right. So maybe I, ha I have an eight hour RPO, but my backup job runs every 12, right? Orchestrator is immediately going to flag that and say, hey, you can't meet your RPO. So you can yep. go and fix it. Yeah. So, so what you're looking at here is, I mean, and this is going to spit out as often as you like, right? And it's going to tell you, you know, yeah. would you pass you the audit? You can schedule it to have it show up in your email every day. You can go in there and run it whenever you want. Up to you. Love that. Love that. All right. And that's going to bring us on to our next thing. And that is test a little test often. So um, a few years ago, um, I was an industry analyst. And when we actually ran some of this research, we actually asked organizations, you know, how often do you test? Right now, now I grew up in the in the SunGuard, ComDisco, IBM BCRS. I grew up in the days of the hot site. Right. And so in the days of the hot site, way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, just so you know, um, and you would declare a disaster and you would put your team on a plane and you'd go into this warehouse and they'd unpack all these servers and you'd roll out the tapes. And that's how it happened. And so because of that, you would normally test about once a year, best case, because it was invasive, it was expensive. I'm telling you, that's not the world that we live in in 2021, right? You can test a yeah, little absolutely. at a time. You can test a workload at a time as often as your little heart desires. Absolutely, Jason. That's a really good point. So, sorry, I get a little emotional on that one. People need to test. Um, talk yeah, to us about how does testing, testing work in this space. Testing is once again, one click. I go in, I right click, I say verify. I go through a quick wizard that will tell me uh, that I pick my plan, what I'm going to test. And another great thing is I could say, leave my environment running after a test. So let's say I said, leave it running for eight hours. Let the app team log in. By the way, they can access their app through the orchestrator UI, HTML5 interface, really easy to use. Let them go in and train the new person. Uh, 
test those patches that came out because there's some nasty security stuff going on right about now. Test application yeah. upgrades. This is our sandbox, right? And we can do that scheduled on demand. And the best part is when you get your test report after it's done, here's a screenshot right here in plain language, green check marks. You have met your RPO, you have met your RTO, you're good to go. And what you should do is schedule that test up to run, you know, every week, every month, whatever, and just have it keep going. There's no reason not to. Yeah, Melissa, what you said earlier around, you know, the app owners not being involved in the process, we all the things we talk about, about pragmatic or operational backup is even more, uh, there's more opportunity to involve them as part of your testing process. So, you know, the, the DBAs come in on the first month of the quarter, right? So the exchange and, and the CRM folks come in the second month of the quarter, but, but once a quarter, let them play in the sandbox because you brought it online. It's completely there. Training the new person, I'd never thought about that. That's a great suggestion for ramping and cross-training skills? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We're coming, uh, we're coming close to time um, and we're coming close to the end. So we're almost out of boxes here. So iterating the plan. Um, it, is, it is amazing to me the number of organizations that I've dealt with over the years where they spent 18 months to develop this plan, usually in a three-ring binder, um, they stuck in a couple trunks, right? Um, and then, and then they wonder two years later because nothing changes in IT over those two years, why the plan no longer is satisfactory. You have some thoughts on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So that plan that worked a year ago, chances are are not going to work um, right now. So what you need to do is keep testing and documenting that plan over and over and over again, right? And the great thing, guess what? Orchestrator is going to do that for you. It's automatically going to test that plan um, when it's been updated, right? And you can actually have uh, your plan updated every day. And again, spit it out an email to your app owners, your C-levels, your backup admins, whoever you want with the most recent state of the plan. Really super easy to do. Yep. Now we're out of boxes, but we're not out of tips. And so just to make sure that we reward the folks that stayed through the whole event, um, we're going to give you a 10th of the nine keys um, for better BCDR. And that is, and this is something that Melissa, you and I have both been preaching in parallel, although I don't think we were saying it exactly the same way for all these years. And that is, is that migrations are disasters that you can plan for. That you plan. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's talk about this for a second. So let's talk about what does it really look like when you're standing up a DR plan um, overall. Uh, we talked at the very beginning around aligning to the needs of the business, right? So business to IT dependencies. We talked about quantifying RPO and RTO that um, Melissa talked about earlier, defining those SLAs between the business units and, um, and the IT teams, um, figuring out who's going to own what pieces. Of course, you're doing backups along the way. So that's always going to be happening there are. as well. Now we're going to stand up secondary infrastructure, right? So we're going to have that secondary right. DR site or service or whatever you're going to, wherever you're going to fail over to, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to rehost that, how you're going to transform those VMs, how you're going to do the physical into virtual, the virtual into cloud. There's, there's a lot of magic and voodoo that happens in this step as to how that secondary infrastructure is going to stand up. Unless of course you happen to be a VMware certified design expert, in which case that's not voodoo, but um, any thoughts on that before we move on with the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as long as it, I'm actually working on a lot of collateral right now about designing for disaster, right? Actually spending the time and effort to properly not only design your disaster recovery plan and processes, but de designing that recovery infrastructure. And one of my favorite things, and I'm about to go on a rodeo with Orchestrator and say is, hey, why don't you test the full scale recovery and just see if your environment can handle it as it is yep. today? Right, because yep. there's a lot of things going on out there. I hate to say it, we haven't said it this whole time, but ransomware, that's a site level recovery, right? You're gonna have to recover everything. So can your recovery infrastructure actually hand, handle that? And how on earth do you test it? You test it with the orchestrator, you just keep on clicking, go, go, go. You can actually chain the plans in orchestrator so that once you click go on one, they'll just keep running them for you as they finish. So it really is truly one click site failover. Okay, I love that. I love that. We have not talked about that, but the idea we is have that it. I'm like, you could, uh, <laughs> you could, you could you know, workload by workload, develop a plan. And we've talked about that. And then and get know, it to the point where those plans all work site by right? site, chain them together. That's yeah, brilliant. absolutely. Okay. So now we've got the secondary set of infrastructure ready to go. Now we have to think about standing up the secondary places. How are we going to replicate the data, backup snapshots, replicas, et cetera. We're going to test usability without affecting production. You mentioned that earlier. Of 
right? Mm -hmm. So now we are prepared for disaster. Da, da, da. We are. Um, now, what happens though is remember the last one of those nine tips was iterate because we know things are going to change, right? So you're going to stand by, you're going to reassess the config, you're going to update the plan, you're going to restage it, you're going to resync it, you're going to retest it. And you are basically in this repetitive loop right up until the bad thing happens. Right. And when the bad mm -hmm. thing happens, you're going to hit the easy button. It's called uh, Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator. And all of a sudden, everything comes back again. But remember, the, the punchline for this 10th tip item is let's take a look at migration. Everything looks almost identical, except instead of it happening at 9 a.m. on a Monday, because that's when the event happened, that's when the water main broke, that's when the flood came through, the fire, whatever, you could schedule this for, I don't know, two o'clock Saturday afternoon, right? Whenever you want, and it will happen Tuesday. automatically for you. And then you'll get a nice report in your inbox while you're sitting on the beach somewhere that says, hey, guess what? Migration successful, everything failed over. You're up and running the new site, congratulations. I don't want to tell you how many three day weekends and holiday weekends that I've given up over the years because on a migration, I it started with a good backup. I have done a fair bit myself. All right, all right. Um, could, if, if Veeam did nothing else, but gave it pros back their weekends, I feel like we've done a service to humanity. Just saying. I think so. I think. All so. right. Um, so that's your 10, right? So we are, uh, we are, we got about 15 minutes left, um, in the survey. And so I'm going to start looking through some of the questions and kind of seeing how the cues out. Um, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, by the way, we got a lot of hello folks out there. We've got some folks from South Carolina and from Texas, from Denver, someone from Jersey weighed in. That's interesting. Um, uh, so all kinds of <laughs> well, that's what I was asking. Uh, but, uh, but let's see what else we got as far as questions to answer along the way. And while I leave that up, how about we go ahead and just leave this up as well? So Melissa, you have, uh, have basically been a, a, one woman champion of orchestration. Uh, at I have been a little bit. Here. Talk about been, some uh, of the things we've been doing to, to make everyone else more successful with orchestration. Yeah. So I've been working on orchestrator basically since it was in beta. I guess, but Jason, we got to Veeam right around the same time, didn't we? It was like, we're two weeks apart. Weeks Either apart. you were two weeks earlier yeah. or I was two weeks earlier. I can't remember. We've been here about the same amount of time. Uh, I've been working on orchestrator the whole time and I've just watched the product evolve. You know, we started with Veeam replicas and in version two, we added uh, Veeam backups, recovering from Veeam backups. In version three, we started with storage integration. We added NetApp on tap storage. In version four, we added CDP. So no matter how you're protecting your data with Veeam backup and replication, we can leverage that with Orchestrator, right? And you don't have to go reconfigure any new data protection jobs or anything. I've seen some platforms are like, oh, you need to go reconfigure your jobs to match the disaster. No, no, we're gonna leverage everything you already have in your environment. And we're just gonna add that orchestration automation layer on top to automatically recover, verify, test, and document all of that for you. Um, so a couple great resources. Version four, like I said, a lot about Veeam CDP I've been doing a lot about, so that's great. Those mission critical apps with near zero RPOs eliminate data loss. Orchestrator's got an API that's interesting if some of you want to play an API. I actually have a demo in my lab where I use Veeam One to monitor my vSphere infrastructure. And when it detects that a cluster is down, it runs a plan in Orchestrator via the Orchestrator API through something called remediation action. And it mm -hmm. recovers everything for me, right? So, okay, the site's down, let me go recover it. So there's so much potential here. And of course you have a 30 day free trial of Orchestrator. Now I can tell you on YouTube, there's videos of me configuring Orchestrator in 20 minutes. So 30 days is more than enough time to put it in there you know, test some of the basic features and functionalities, pick a really simple app to get started with and kind of see for yourself how much time you're going to save when it comes to disaster recovery, planning, document, documentation and testing with this orchestration and automation layer on top. I there's some great guidance in there. Let's go to some questions because I've been I've been All digging right. through some of these along the way. Uh, let's see. So uh, first and foremost, um, I love the uh, we had several questions on um, how do we raise the prioritization of BCDR within um, within senior management, um, which I think is a which is is a great topic. What we often see is is that whenever there is a disaster um, in your neck of the woods. All of a sudden, the execs get really, really interested in it for a little while, and then um, uh, memory fades. 
And so what I would suggest to you is, is that if you, if you um, don't treat disaster recovery as its own initiative, Disaster recovery should be part of a comprehensive data protection strategy. And if you modernize backup correctly, meaning harnessing the power of snapshots and replication, meaning adding orchestration along the way, then you don't have to think about disaster as that dire once in a three year kind of crises. Think about it just as the next step in evolving. How do you remediate any kind of outage, big or small? You just happen to get whole site almost as a, as an after effect. Um, but modernize it as part of your data protection strategy. Don't think of it as its own standalone initiative more often than not. I've, Listen, what I've got thought? a little pro tip. I got a pro tip. Okay. Uh, so a ransomware recovery plan is just a disaster recovery plan that's actually up to date and tested on a regular basis. If your execs well, like haven't gone into Google lately or any search engine of their choice and typed in ransomware attack and seen everything in the news, and remember, we're just seeing a very small fraction. This is your last line of defense, right? Yeah. With all the new patches. I mean, I think there's another printer exploit that came out today with all the new vulnerabilities and everything coming out. This is your last line of defense when it comes to ransomware is being able to do a site level recovery with confidence, right? Knowing that it's gonna work because it's properly documented and testing. So really go the ransomware cyber event. That's what everybody needs to be discussing right now because it's not, oh, it's not gonna happen to us. It's not if we get ransomware, it is when you are ransomware and you will be recovering your stuff. Yeah. So speaking of ransomware, another great question came in on air gapping. Um, now, I'm going to add air gapping um, and add the concepts of immutability to that. But how do we ensure that we have, for lack of a better term, indestructible data so that we can recover during these kinds of crises? Now, the question actually, um, Peter is asking, do we have that on the roadmap? We do immutability and assured data everywhere. Today. We do it everywhere. Yes. Talk that out. Yeah, absolutely. So through the use of something called the Veeam scale out backup repository, we're doing immutability at every layer, right? So what I've been telling my customers is keep some of those backups on prem on super fast storage for super fast restores through the uh, use of Veeam's hardened repository, which is just based on Linux, really simple to set up. You can make that immutable, right? So you have a mutable, really super fast on prem recovery point. Then when we scale it out, we go to things like S3 type storage with and with the use of S3 object lock, right? You know, the big cloud providers have it. You can get um, third party providers. There's so many ways to consume S3 based storage, right? There's immutability tied in there, too. So kind of like immutability through every tier of the life cycle of your data. Um, you could leverage that to recover from in the event that you are ransomware. So we have immutable immutability everywhere on top of it. And remember, Orchestrator is going to integrate with Veeam backup and replication. So anything you can do in BNR from a, hey, this is the repo we're using, we can recover from. Yep. Uh, so we've got some questions around stretch budgets and can, or uh, this is an interesting one. Don't you feel enterprises can easily do with 99% uptime? First of all, I don't know a whole lot of organizations that are really getting 99% uptime, but, but here's what I would offer. Again, it always goes back to what is the cost of 1%? Right. Figure out the cost of one percent. And my guess is, is that um, you will likely find that the cost of mitigating that one percent downtime, even if it's just one percent improvement. Right. Ninety six to ninety seven or ninety nine to one hundred. The cost of mitigating downtime is almost always far cheaper, far cheaper than the cost of actually incurring the outage overall. Absolutely. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, data insurance. Um, is becoming an important part of the strategy. Um, uh, other than if, if we're talking about cyber insurance, here's the problem, right? Let's say, all right, I have my cyber insurance policy. I got ransomware. I paid the ransom. My insurance policy paid me. I'm sorry, but you still need to do a total recovery. You cannot trust that data. The integrity of the data, once it's been encrypted, is completely gone. Who knows what they put in that decryption tool that you paid for? So no matter, even if you pay the ransom because you need to get back on on time quickly, you still need to rebuild everything. You really do. 
Well, also, uh, Jeff Reichard and uh, um, and uh, Dave Russell, they had a LinkedIn live stream earlier this week. They were talking about actually that topic, among others, and talking about the fact that a lot of organizations are no longer offering the kinds of cyber insurance policies they were writing just a few years ago because the insurance companies are figuring out they are way too cost prohibitive to actually make good on that. So please check out our colleagues on the LinkedIn live stream for that. Uh, Melissa, this one's for you. So Pedro is asking about the license model. For orchestration, is it based on VM or how is it actually monetized? Uh, exactly. So it is based on VM. You buy it in packs of 10, but there's a couple of cool ways to consume it. So you can say, okay, I have a thousand VMs protected by Veeam. I'm just going to start with my mission critical applications, blah, blah, blah. That's great. But if you actually go in and you protect your whole uh, VM based Veeam environment, there's really a significant savings that you can achieve there. And I mean, it's really significant. So please reach out to your Veeam sales team so they can give you more details. It really is something that's obtainable and it's a lot more economical than most other disaster recovery solutions on the market. Uh, Carrie is asking about, um, they'd like to use a cloud provider um, as part of their solution. So the uh, the question is, they've looked at a couple cloud providers. They're not really where they should be. This is coming from a storage and backup guy, 25 plus years. I'm in that category too. <laughs> um, uh, who are the top two partners we should be looking at so we can stop wasting our time? Okay, so it, that radically depends on what part of the country that you're from. Um, you can actually see our email addresses uh, there. If you'll send out to me, you can reach out to your sales team too, but you can reach out to me uh, directly and I'll point you to some of the ones that I like. Uh, I will tell you that the, the tools radically vary between cloud providers. And in many cases, it's based on what kind of infrastructure that you're recovering. So for example, if you want to recover, say, VMware to VMware, which is, um, uh, uh, you know, Melissa's uh, uh, gold star, you know, look for a cloud <laughs> provider that actually gives you access to actual ESX hypervisors on that secondary side, because then it's just like using your own secondary data center. In deference to that, if you want to do something that transforms that and leverages a cloud host in its native state, that's going to look different. But admittedly, not all the tools are as mature as data center to data center center tools. So there are some trade offs from an agility perspective to where do you want it to land as secondary infrastructure. But, but send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll actually send it to both of us and we'll both give you our yeah. favorites from that perspective. Okay. Um, I, I think Gilbert's actually is probably the, one of the most brilliant quotes I've seen um, on one of these uh, trailblazers. Uh, the best way to catch a thief is to think like a burglar. And so certainly when you're thinking about uh, whether it's ransomware preparedness or whether you're thinking about how you're going to recover from a fire, right? Think about, okay, so what's actually going to happen in that crisis, right? Th think like the fire, be the fire, or maybe ransomware is a better option, but I just think it's a brilliant quote, nothing to answer for. I just think it's cool. So, um, uh, Melissa, one more for you, and we're coming close on time. Uh, most important advice. Now, the question here is most important advice on data hygiene, but I'm just going to kind of pair that back a little bit and just say most important advice, what's the one golden nugget that you hope everyone took out of today's talk? We'll finish with two pearls of wisdom and call it done. Yeah, absolutely. Um Make sure you have the right people at the table, and it's probably more than you think. You need the IT people, but you need the business owners, because until we nail down those, from a technical standpoint, right, until we nail down those RPOs and RTOs, and that we're only going to get through doing the business impact analysis with all the stakeholders, right, until we nail those down, we can't confidently protect and restore our data the right way, because the way you need to architect your recovery solution, I'm not even going to call it protection solution, I'm going to call it recovery solution, is going to be different based on what those RPOs and RTOs are and how they're combined. So that is probably my single thing. Start early with the right people at the table so you don't get to the end of the project and be like, wait, this isn't going to work. I cannot believe you totally took mine. Mine was going to be, you got to get the right people at the table. All right. So if, if you're going to channel the business side, then I'm going to channel the technical side. Okay. And that is um, uh, orchestrate everything. Um, humans are not good at repetitive tasks. <laughs> they are not good at repetitive detailed tasks. They are not uh, it's good risky. at repetitive it's, detailed it's tasks. Risk. It introduces risk into the environment. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're not good at repetitive detailed tasks where executives are standing over their shoulders waiting for recovery to happen. Right. So, so orchestrate everything, script it, orchestrate it, and then test your orchestration layer. So I'm channeling my Melissa on this one. Uh, <laughs> with that, um, Melissa, thank you. I, I knew we would have fun uh, doing this. Thank you this for was joining fun. me. Thank All you, Jason. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for visiting today. 
Um, uh, we're here to help. You've got our email addresses. Please don't be bashful. Um, we're going to make DR better for you. Give us the chance. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, Melissa, Jason, that was a fun conversation. I learned a lot uh, to all of our attendees. I hope you learned as much as I did. One last thing before we go, uh, I'm sure you didn't forget. I've got a $300 Amazon gift card to give away to one lucky winner. And that lucky winner is Don Potter from Tennessee. Don Potter from Tennessee. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, Don will be in touch to deliver that gift card via email. And to everybody else, thank you for your great questions and for your attention. It was great, and I hope you learned a lot. And we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day, everybody.